السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم قال يا بني لا تقصص رؤياك على إخوتك فيكيدوا لك كيدا إن الشيطان للإنسان عدو مبين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Ahmabad. I was totally flipping pages to get to Surah Yusuf and I hadn't got there yet, but Sami pressed the record button, so I had to pretend that I'm looking at the ayah and reciting it. I was reciting it from memory, so I just flipped the page over so I can get to the right page now so that I can look over at it at the right time. But anyway, I thought I should share that with you in the spirit of transparency. Anyway, Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Today, inshallah, we're going to study ayah number five of Surah Yusuf. Uh, he has told his father the dream. We talked about that yesterday. And now the dad is going to respond. The last thing I told you was dad's going to tell him two things. One of the things he's going to tell him is going to be in this ayah. And the next thing he's going to tell him is going to be in ayah number six. And that'll be tomorrow, inshallah. So let me first translate the ayah little by little for you. And then we'll uh, dig deeper. قَالَ يَا بُنَيَّ لَا تَقْصُصْ رُؤْيَاكَ عَلَىٰ إِخْوَتِكَ فَيَكِيدُ لَكَ كَيْدًا إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ لِلْإِنسَانِ عَدُوٌ مُبِينَ The first part, my son. He says, my young son or my little son, يَا بُنَيَّ يَا بُنَيَّ um, My son. يَا بُنَيَّ This is اسم تصغير, بُنَيْ uh, Which means little son or my young boy, things like that. And then he says, لَا تَقْصُصْ رُؤْيَاكَ Don't narrate your dream or don't tell your dream. Don't outline your dream also. عَلَىٰ إِخْوَتِكَ to your brothers. فَيَكِيدُوا لَكَ كَيْدًا Then they, as a result of you telling them, then they might make a scheme against you, for sure. They, they'll definitely make a scheme against you. It seems there's a certainty here because of the word كَيْدًا, which we'll dig into. Then he says, إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ لِلْإِنسَانِ عَدُوٌ مُبِينٌ Without a doubt, the devil, when it comes to the human being, is certainly an obvious and open enemy. So there are these little parts in this statement, the statement, the, the, Summary of it is obvious, I've even put it in the title, don't tell your brothers. We can just say that and move on. But I think there's a few things here that pay that we need to pay attention to that are worthy of taking guidance from. Again, my philosophy and my, my approach to the study of any surah, and particularly this one, is that Allah is highly selective in what He's telling us from the story. So every little bit that He tells us needs our attention. There's nothing that we can skip over and say, yeah, yeah, I got it, I got it. We can move on to the next thing. We got to stop, take pause, and you know, فَلَمْ يَدَّبَّرُوا الْقَوْلَ Why didn't they stop and look back? What is behind the word that's being said? تَدَّبُّر in Arabic, which means they translate that as contemplation or reflection, uh, comes from the word dubur, and dubur actually means the back. And so, you know, you may see, for example, you may see a wall, but you wonder the way the wall is designed, what must be behind it, right? Or you see a sign, and a sign is pointing to a, a garden or something. So further down, what's behind the sign, the actual garden? And what must that be like? So when Allah gives you something, an ayah, then He wants you to reflect deeply what are the meanings and messages and benefits and wisdom behind what he's saying? Why did he choose to tell you this one word? What's behind it? And the act of pondering about that and wondering how can I get guidance? How can I get advice from Allah from that one word that he shared? Or from that one phrase that he shared? Or from that one little scene that he described? What is behind it that's going to make my life better? That's the act of tadabbur and that's why we don't... We don't skip over anything in the Qur'an. And actually Allah even complains about that elsewhere. When He says, you know, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِّرُوا بِآيَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ لَمْ يَخِرُّوا عَلَيْهَا صُمًّا وَعُمْيَانًا When they're reminded, the, the, the true believers, the ones that, the, the slave, servants of Allah and slaves of Allah that He loves, عِبَادُ Rahman are the kinds of people, that when they're reminded of the, the revelations and the signs, of their master, when that reminder is given to them, they don't trip over it summan wa umyanan, like deaf and blind. Like they just kind of trip over it and keep going. You know? They don't just stumble on it and just keep moving on. So this is something that I, I don't want to be a culprit of myself. And I want you and myself to get in the habit of pausing and really contemplating with humility the word of Allah. And you know, what I, what I think about the ayah or what I discuss with my dear colleague Sheikh Suhaib and others about the ayah and you know, what, I, what conclusions I come to about the ayah may not be correct. That's a human effort. It has to be a sincere effort. And we have to keep in mind that nobody's thoughts or interpretations are going to override or be the highest position above Allah's word. Allah's word is always the highest and ours are only attempts to grasp at some, some drops of its wisdom. 
right? So nobody will have mastery over the Qur'an. Nobody will have the definitive answer over everything the ayah has to offer. And even our attempts to seek its guidance are going to be human attempts at the end of the day, to the best of our ability. So we ask Allah, as we engage in that process, لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا not, not to let our hearts deviate after He's guided them. Right? So there's a, there's a humility that's necessary in contemplating the word of Allah. But having said that and having reminded myself of that too, uh, let's dig deep into some of the... Some of the beautiful words Allah says in this ayah. So He says, Ya Bunayya, my, my young son, my beloved son, my dear son. Um, I mean, my Urdu translation of this would be a little awkward. Like it's like a little, it's a loving phrase. When you, you don't just say to your son, my little son, except out of love. Now the thing here is, he could have, he's in conversation with his son, Yaqub is, right? And his son just told him a dream. And before the son told him the dream, he said, my father. Even though when you talk to someone, you don't have to say my father, you can just start talking, right? So when you talk to your son, and you're just next, uh, there's one thing that your son is in the other room, or they're downstairs, and you're like, Austin, or say, but if they're right here, then you just say, hey, did you this, this, or this? Did you eat your food? Did you finish? Did you pray? You don't have to say their name now, because they're right there in front of you. So calling someone by their name is in this nida is adatut tambi. When you call someone, it's a means to get their attention. And it's usually done when somebody's far away or they're not paying attention. But clearly, this is an intimate one-on-one -on -one conversation where son is talking to father first, and nobody else is around. So for him to even in that context say my son, or, or for him to say my beloved father, and then say the dream, and then for the son to hear from the dad, not just here's what you do, here's what you don't do, but before the dad says it, he says, my son, my beloved son, my little son, before he moves for further, that requires our attention. Because normally you don't call people like that, um, except if they're far away or they're not paying attention. So what's the benefit of them calling each other first? You see, the way you address someone with love and respect, it actually is a form of comfort. It's a form of comfort. So... A lot of times in relationships, uh, you know, you, uh, some, sometimes fathers or mothers never tell their children they love them. They just don't tell them that. Or they don't call them with loving names. They just say, hey, what's this in the kitchen? Hey, you, what are you doing? Like, like that. But when you say, you know, you know uh, not my beloved, because that sounds a little Shakespearean, but, you know, hey, I love you, come here. Hey, my, hey, my beautiful boy, come here. Hey, my wonderful daughter, come here. Like even these little, little phrases, what do they do before the come here? The come here is going to get said anyway. Right? But when you cushion what you're going to say, whatever it may be, maybe an instruction, maybe a conversation, maybe even something harsh that you have to say, but when you cushion it like that, what does it do to the listener? Whatever they're about to say, they want, before they say it, they want me to know that love and respect is there. And then they're telling me what they're telling me. A lot of times we're not, even some, if sometimes when they give us good advice, but they don't talk to us in a way that makes us feel respected or loved, then even good advice isn't very attractive. You don't want to hear it. Because of the way somebody's talking. And they could have made it a lot easier to absorb if they simply addressed you and you know, even not even directly saying, I love you and I respect you, but calling you by your name. <coughs> and the tone in which you call someone can actually make a huge difference. If somebody called me and said, Noman, it's different. Somebody else said, Noman, Noman, Noman. Like if they did any of that, I already know this isn't going to go well. Right? Tone changes everything. So the words are also kind of indicative of the tone. He's going to take this loving, comforting, protective tone to his son instead of just giving him an instruction. <clears throat> the thing with parents sometimes can be, and not just parents, anybody who feels like they have a, some level of influence in the relationship. Sometimes a wife can feel like she has influence over her husband. A husband can feel like they have influence over the wife. An older brother or sister can feel like they have influence over the younger brother or sister. They have a say. And when they feel like they have a say, they can talk however they want. Because I get to. Yeah, you get to. They're your family. They're not going anywhere. You wouldn't talk to somebody outside like that. Because they're not family So if you're in a job interview Or you're talking to a police officer Or you're talking to a person at the grocery store There's going to be some level of decorum and respect But when you're talking to your own family It's kind of like, yeah, whatever And then when guests come over You become all dignified human beings again Like, ah, do your best No, no, you can't be like that Khairukum khairukum li ahlihi. The best of you are the ones that are at their best behavior To their own families, the Prophet said 
Sallallahu So why is it that we're a certain respectful, dignified, you know, non-sarcastic, non-aggressive, non-passive aggressive, not loud, you know, not harsh words kind of way when we deal with other people? And when, we're not, when it comes to our own family, we, we can't say kind words. It kind of hurts. And if you're Pakistani, it really hurts. I'm telling you, I'm talking about myself. You know, because you can't give compliments. It kind of it, there's a there's a bone Allah created in Pakistanis over here. It hurts extra hard if you give a compliment to family. Like if your wife cooks something and it tastes good, and you say that tasted really good. You're like ah, and then you have to balance the equation and say, but I still hate your mother. Oh, I feel better. Because <sighs> you have to you have to balance the equation with some kind of harsh thing that has to be said. Then you're like, okay, it's okay now. But you see, the fa- the son is talking to the father with respect and with love. And the father isn't just saying, yeah, you better show me respect. I'm your dad. And I get to talk to you this way because I'm your dad. No, he says, ya bunaya, my beloved son, my son, my little son who I love. It's like he's putting his arm around Yusuf alayhi salam. It's like he's holding him close and comforting him. And then he's, in, in that act alone, he's, before he says anything else, just this, you see, the previous ayah was, Yusuf was scared. Remember? He even added, Dad, I love and respect you in the, the word Ja'abati because he's, he's not sure if this is going to... How is Dad going to respond to this? Is he going to like what I said? Is he going to think I'm saying something outrageous? And so, he's scared to say what he's saying. But he, he has no one else to talk to. He has this absolute trust in his dad. And he says it anyway, reluctantly, and with those hesitations. But when he says it, the first act of Ya Bunaya is already descending of all kinds of comfort onto the son. My dad, I'm not in trouble with him. And there's a sort of ease that dawns on this boy, on this child, just because of that Ya Bunaya. Now again, in translation we say, my son, don't tell this dream to your, uh, your dream to your brothers. And we skip over what part? My son. We skip over that part like it's insignificant. It's a pretty big deal. The way we talk to our children, the comfort we give them, the acceptance we give them, the, the way we make them feel loved by those words that we address them with. And you know what? I would argue that this shouldn't change as children get older. This should remain, and this should remain into their adulthood that we should address them with love and respect. Parents to children, children to parents. Because a time comes when our kids had developed so much resentment towards their parents. And when you... And then the father is like, why are you talking to me like this? Because you never treated me like a person. You never acknowledged me. You never said something good about me. When was the last time you gave me a hug? And the dad's like, you, that's, that's your mother's job. I, when you need a hug from me? You're a man. Uh, you're still a child. You're a human being. And you need that comforting from both father and from mother. And here, here a father is providing that emotional support. He's playing that role. He's not the authoritarian. And that's a prophet. So no father who thinks, a father who thinks that by being tough, by being this rigid, you know, drill sergeant, that I'm somehow building character into my children, you may be creating walls in your children. You may be destroying their confidence. And then parents have this, some fathers have this twisted idea. If I'm not tough with him, or if I'm not tough with her, they're not going to be able to face the real world. Seriously, bro, what Quran are you reading? Because the Quran says that this child was raised with so much love, and later on he's in jail, and he can handle himself. He's in a, in a crazy situation in the palace. He can handle himself. Later on, he's facing off against the king and he can handle himself. And all of that isn't just coming from the fact that he's a prophet. It's coming from the pr- fact that he was nurtured and empowered and made to feel confident in himself by the loving care that he received from his father. Which is why this is the opening, the starting point. Like everything else that's happening in the story, Allah felt it, Allah, Allah saw it in his wisdom important for us to understand all of what is going to transpire like a tree that's going to grow comes from this seed and this conversation is that seed so it's not insignificant and if it if this is so significant that this upbringing leads to the saving of a generation like an entire nation was sta- saved from starvation from the 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 valuation the, the 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 validation that father gave to son if it just came from that, can you imagine how many future generations are you and I destroying by not validating our children and what trees they might transform into? What, what good they could bring to the world? What amazing things they can accomplish if only we believe in them, we give them that nurturing love and care. We, we do our job as parents. Ya Bunaya, my beloved son. And then he says, La taqsus ru'yaka. Now it's, it's 
pretty interesting that before he tells him what to do, he says, don't tell your dream to your brothers. And the first thing I want to note here is the, the don't tell part. Not why that's significant from a psychological point of view, but um, the words are لا تقصص. Not لا تخبر, don't inform, right? And he could have said لا تنبي, don't inform, don't, don't give the news of, don't talk to, لا تقول, don't say, لا تحدث, don't talk. He said لا تقصص, قصص. نحن نقص عليك أحسن القصص. Same word again. Well, it's an interesting anchor Allah dropped here because he used the word qissa in the, in the third ayah. نحن نقص عليك أحسن القصص. So the word is still ringing in my head because Allah said it two ayahs ago. And now he says, don't do qissa of this dream to your brothers. Now Allah is contrasting. Allah tells the best of all stories. Allah tells the best of all qissa. And then father is telling son, don't tell this qissa, the qissa of this dream to your brothers. So we are being told we have the gift of having this narration told to us, this, this account, this story being told to us. And the father is telling the son, don't tell this story. What are we learning from that? Allah knows, Allah in His wisdom knows when to tell someone something. Allah knew in His wisdom when to reveal the story to the Prophet Yusuf salam, And that was an act of wisdom from Allah. And the father who's divinely guided knows that some things, some stories are not meant to be told to certain people. And we have to have the wisdom in our life to know what things to share with some people and what things not to share with some people. And what time and what people we have to share things with, especially when it comes to family. You don't tell everything to everyone in the family if you know some of them have a problem. If some of them cannot be trusted with certain things because of their behavior. If some of them have been abusive in the past, if some, some of them can't handle such situations because they haven't been able to handle such situations before, if some of them have shown a pattern of behavior where every time you entrust them with you know, something you tell them, then they go out and do wrong. They go out and do wrong with it. Then don't put yourself in that position when it comes to your brothers. لا تقصص رؤياك على إخوتك. So Allah will tell at the right time and human beings should watch it when to tell and what not to tell. This is important now. By the way, in saying don't tell your brothers, how many brothers does he have? Eleven. That I saw eleven stars, the sun and the moon. Don't tell your eleven brothers you saw this. Isn't it already clear that he knows? Isn't it already clear that he also knows that Yusuf knows? Because right after he mentions the eleven stars, here we are talking about your brothers. So clearly between the two of them, they're highly intelligent. Between the two of them, they already know what this dream means and who it's about and who's about to be humbled. Now let's think about that dream and why not tell why not tell your brothers? First and foremost, the thing to note is the idea of sajda is to be overpowered by something. We are overpowered in the awe of Allah when we drop into sajda. So clearly, it seems that there is a kind of conflict in, w- in which one has a position of superiority and one is being suppressed. And it seems at this point that Yusuf is being suppressed. And eventually there's going to be a state in which they are going to feel like they're suppressed, they're overpowered, and they're going to get humbled because of what's been granted to Yusuf a.s. So the, the tables are going to turn. So even in the dream of sajda, there seems to be some suggestion that someone is basically beat down, and they're going to be in a position where you're afraid they're going to beat you down. And you're surrendering before them because of what Allah has given them. So it's kind of this conflict image that's being depicted. And so the dream also meant, in a sense, that there's going to be some level of conflict between him and his brothers. Notice in his response, he didn't include, don't tell your, your brothers, nor your mom. Don't tell your mom either, okay? Because that's the same as telling your brothers, she'll go tell everybody anyway. He doesn't include the mom, because the mom and dad aren't part of the conflict. Who's in the conflict? The brothers are. So, Yaqub a.s. in his interpretation of the dream also understands that the 11 stars are a separate entity and the sun and the moon are a separate entity and the problem entity is the 11 stars. So he only talks about the 11 stars. And he says, don't tell your dream to your brothers. Also, I'm, I'm curious about the words your dream, ru'yaka, as opposed to هذا ru'ya or هذه ru'ya, this dream. Don't tell this dream to your brothers. He said your dream. The word your dream suggesting this dream clearly puts you at the center of attention. This dream clearly puts you in some position of superiority. It puts you in some position of authority. And that is something they cannot stand. They don't like that. They're not going to want to see that. 
that you are now even by divine and they're familiar with divine wisdom and divine revelation your brothers are they're muslim too they're sons of a prophet too and their prophet ali sam he's taught them how revelation works and if the son is getting and they know that they have generations of prophethood among them yes their father is a prophet their grandpa is a prophet their great grandpa is a prophet so they know prophethood continues in this and there's a promise to that of that given to ibrahim alayhi salam so now if he tells this dream that they're going to know that this gift of prophethood was given to who to Yusuf, we already don't like him, and now on top of that, we can't even say nothing about him because he's a prophet. Oh, that's great. That's just great. They're not going to like this, which is a remarkable parallel with the life of our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the Israelites who came into contact with our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in Medina. They hated the fact that this revelation came to him. An yuta ahadum mithlama utikum utito. You should accept someone who was given something that you used to be given. That would used to be yours, and now he's getting it? And they're going to later on claim, we're the ones that are worthy. And he's supposed to be blessed by God too, not just blessed by our father? Huh! I don't like this equation. And dad sees that you being chosen in this way is not going to sit well with them. This is actually a pretty interesting um, you know, placement, because when the Prophet ﷺ was told this, one narration says the Jews came and asked him of Medina. They came and asked him, "How did how did the Israelites end up in Egypt anyway, huh?" And Allah is tell, and they were like trying to get a gotcha question, and Allah revealed this surah. <laughs> and when He revealed this surah, He also included in it, "Oh, you know, the sons of Israel didn't like when one of them, one, the one they didn't want to get revelation, got revelation. They got pretty jealous." Oh wait, does that sound like you guys right now? Okay. <laughs> You see what he, what Allah did there? They got the gotcha happened to them. <laughs> That's how that works. It got turned right back around on them. So this is la taqsusru yaka ala ikhwatika. Because in a sense, they are also the brothers of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu because they're all children of Ibrahim, aren't they? So they're distant brothers too. And ha, you know, and if when they know, Allah says in tusibka. He said about the Prophet ﷺ, "In tusibka hasanatun tasuhum." If something good happens to you, they hate it. If something good comes to you, they can't stand it. And so now we're we're gonna look at this. We're gonna look at this from the sun's point of view tomorrow, or the day after, because they're gonna talk too, right? So we'll see their point of view when they talk. Right now, we're trying to see things from the father's point of view, because the father is the one talking. And so the father says, "Don't tell your your dream, your vision to your brothers." Clearly, the dads got them clocked. A fa- this father is a very observant one. He knew that the son needed comforting before he needed anything else. So the first thing he said was, Ya Budaya. So Yaqub is pretty observant and pretty aware of every word and every ex- emotional expression that's taking place in front of him. Which means, I refuse to believe, like some people believe, with all due respect to them, I cannot believe that Yaqub was somehow more loving to one son and less loving to the others. I do not believe this to be the case. I believe it to be the case that he was a loving father all around and that he was concerned about the well-being of all of his children. And those who do good, they don't get in trouble. When you have kids and some kids do well, then you're proud of them and you want to reward them or you want to hug them or you want to acknowledge their good behavior or their good grades or their good accomplishment or when they clean up their room without being told or if they, you know, if they fix something or if they help with something and you didn't even have to ask them then you will, you know, if you're just lying in bed coughing and your son comes and gives you a glass of water and presses your head and you never even ask them then you're going to put your hand on their, hand on their head and make dua for them and kiss them on the forehead and say Jita ro beta in Urdu you know May you live long and prosper, son. May Allah protect you. I love you so much. That's so sweet of you. You'll acknowledge that act of love. You'll look at them in a loving way. This child, I didn't even ask them. I didn't even tell them. And then you have a kid, you're saying, Hey, it's Maghrib. Uh-huh. It's Maghrib. Uh-huh. It's Maghrib. Uh-huh. It's Maghrib the next day. Uh-huh. And then you're going to come in front of the PlayStation 4 and the TV and then you're going to be this, you know, you're going to be the wall drop between the two and you'll be like, I told you Maghrib. And then this kid's going to be like, Oh yeah? I saw you kissing his forehead. I saw you giving him a hug. Are you going to talk to me like that? It's not fair. You love him more than you love me. No. You need a tough love. And he deserved soft love. You, he can't give me a glass of water and I slap it away and say, Next time bring it faster. What is he talking about? 
Yaqub alayhi salam is going to give tough love sometimes when it's needed. And he's going to give gentle love when it's, when it's deserved. But instead of looking at themselves, they're going to blame dad, right? But father knows they have a tendency. Father knows they have a tendency not to, you know, not to take responsibility for themselves, but find someone or something else to blame. If it wasn't for Yusuf, he would actually see the good we have in us. Dad already knows how they think. And dad knows if you tell them this, it's not going to be good. Don't tell your brothers. In fact, avoid this conversation with your brothers at all cost. لا تقصص رؤياك على إخوتك. Don't tell your brothers. Now he's a kid, and he's being told to be careful of one of his own siblings. Yes, and he's his older siblings. And your older siblings are someone you look up to. You want to be strong like them when you grow up. You want to learn to drive the car like them when they grow, when you grow up. You want to go to college like they do when they grow up. You want to get your job like they. You want to dress like them. That's why younger siblings. You know, want to pull a shirt out of their brother's closet. Can I wear this one? No, that's mine. You, you want to be friends with their friends. You, when, you, when you have an older sibling, they become a kind of role model to you. When you start losing that connection with your, you know, the parental figure, then it's the, the cooler teenage brother, the cooler brothers that are older, that you want to emulate and be like. And older siblings find that annoying. He's always looking at my stuff. He's always trying to get, you know, so they, they see that as annoying, but it's actually admiration of one kind. That they're constantly hovering around and trying to be like you. They, they need someone to mentor after. But that's being taken away from Yusuf, isn't it? His dad's telling him, alayhi salam, you don't have that kind of relationship with your brothers. Don't tell them this good that happened to you. You don't need, you don't need that kind of attention from them. They're, you actually have what's, what seems, you have a toxic relationship with them. Or actually, they have a toxic relationship with you. Our thing is, sometimes we don't want to talk about harsh realities in a family with children because we want to shield them they're not old enough to handle it. But what is the Qur'an teaching us? Sometimes there are realities inside a family that were not under your control. You did not control how, what your kids' personalities are going to turn out to be, who your uncle is going to be, who your cousins are going to be. You didn't control any of that. And if there are harsh realities, then you need to be able to warn your kids about them and say, that's not okay. This, you need to be careful of these, these, these people. I know they're your cousins. But if, you know, and, and, you know I, it's, a harsh, it's a difficult subject, but it should be said, because some of you have trouble saying this to your kids, so I'll say it for you. And I know a lot of kids are watching too. Look, sometimes we have extended family, and, and there are studies on this across the world, the Muslim world, the non-Muslim world. A lot of abuse of children of the worst kinds happens from family members. Uncles, cousins, you know, visits, Christmas break, Eid break. People being pulled into, kids being pulled into a room. All kinds of crazy things happen. The worst, most terrible, traumatizing things that can ruin a child's future happen with people that they felt safe with. And you as a parent, you as a guardian have to have an eye on your children. And you have to have an eye on even if they're family. You know this entire stupid notion that the family's always right? We don't talk about our family? In fact, what's even done now is something terrible like that happens and then our children are told, be quiet about it. It's going to make the family look bad. We don't talk about your uncle like that. We don't talk about your cousin like that. No, it must have been something wrong with you. It's flipped on the kid itself. Instead of doing everything to protect the children, we want to protect the family name. If anybody was interested in protecting the family name, it should be a prophet who's the great-grandson of a prophet. But he's not interested in protecting the family name. He's interested in protecting the child. And he's saying, listen, you need to keep a safe distance from your brothers. What that means is, it's okay to have a conversation with our own children, sometimes about their own siblings. And what problems they may Maybe there are families who's there's a son who's got a drug problem. And he's the older brother. He's got an alcohol problem. There's a daughter who, who's left the, left the faith and she's saying all kinds of vile words and has all kinds of vile relationships and she's in the house, she's cursing at the parents. And a 10-year-old boy is looking at all this, right? He has to be given an orientation on how to handle this situation. You know, that happens. Rebellious children happen. That's why the Qur'an talks about it. وَيْلَكَ amin. Parents are saying, come on, why won't you just have faith? It happens. Difficult situations in families happen. And if they didn't happen, Allah would give the prophet, He loves the Prophet so much, He would give every Prophet a family that looks like a bed of roses. You know, butterflies and rainbows. But that's not prophetic family. Prophet's family's got some messed up issues, man. Why? Because He knew we're going to have some messed up issues in our families. And we got to have the courage to be able to empower our kids to love them 
and nurture them and then also tell them that's dangerous kiddo that that's not okay you got to watch it okay i want you to be careful with your brothers don't tell them this is a profound teaching and i argue if this teaching is applied so many children can be saved from so much trauma but you can only do so much because as the story goes that wasn't enough was it because sometimes people are hell bent on doing harm and no matter how much you prepare your children if you know if that was that was written for them and that had to happen then it will happen but you do everything you can just like yaqub did everything he could he did whatever precaution he could take. It's kind of like, if I go back to the comparison of Musa and, and, and uh, Yusuf alayhi salam, his mom took, took whatever precaution she could take. And it worked out. And he's doing whatever preca- precaution he can take, but it didn't work out the way he had hoped, you see? So we do our part, and then the rest is up to Allah. But at least we do our part. Either way, we don't say, well, Allah is going to do what Allah is going to do, so I don't have to say anything. No, you do. You do. لا تقصص رؤياك على إخوتك. Then what did he say about his brothers? He says, فَيَكِيدُوا لَكَ كَيْدًا You know, he, he, he let them know that they are going, they, they are going to scheme against you. They, they're going to have a scheme hashed, especially for you. لَكَ the lam, some, some argue, you know, because in Quran you have that without the lam, there's a maf'ul bihi directly, فَكِيدُونِ فَإِن كَادَ لَكُمْ كَيْدٌ إِن كَانَ لَكُمْ كَيْدٌ فَكِيدُونِ it's not fakidu li, it's fakidu ni. It's the damir muttasil, it's the attached pronoun immediately. But the lam here is an add-on to emphasize that especially when it comes to you, they are going to make a scheme. They're at a point where they're going to start scheming. And then he adds what's called a maf'ul mutlaq, an, an, uh, 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 an object of the verb whose only purpose is to stress the intensity of the act as if Yaqub is saying, don't tell them because they... I, I'm telling you then, they are certainly going to make a scheme, especially when it comes to you, they're going to start scheming. They're going to do it. And that's a pretty, like he's pretty convinced that they're going to do it. Now let me tell you something about qaid, what I translated as scheme, so let's talk about that. The first thing you need to know about scheming is that it's done in secret. Like in the, the meaning actually includes secrecy in it. It also means it has many steps. Actually, kada in Arabic was used for when someone's holding in vomit. Or if a woman is about to have her menses and she's holding it in, halat. That's what waqadat al-mar'a is used for. So, or when, you know, the fire is about to pour out, but it's building up before it's poured out of the bellow. That's actually also from the meaning of qaid. All of those thematic meanings have something brewing inside, something harmful brewing inside, something disgusting brewing inside, something impure brewing inside, something treacherous brewing inside, and eventually it comes out. And you won't know that it's coming until the last moment, and it's, until it's too late. Right? So basically what the father is telling him is, you're going to tell this dream to your brothers, they're going to smile in your face. And then they're going to make an elaborate evil scheme, and you won't know that they're scheming until it's too late. That's what he's telling them. How does the dad know all this? You could argue he knows this by revelation. I would argue, alayhi salam, he knows this because he knows his kids. He knows that they're two-faced. He knows that they don't talk to him really. They only talk to each other. You see, the fact that they secretly talk to each other, how would he know? He walks by, he sees them having their conversations. He knows when they make lame excuses. Yeah, dad, we're going to be out in the back. We're going to, you know, smoke some straws. Or they're not doing anything outside. They're having a conversation with each other about the family or, you know, talking trash about their dad, which they're used to, which is going to come. They're going to speak ill of their father. And the dad knows. He's not naive. They didn't go out for a drive. Oh, we're going to drive the donkey around the farm. <laughs> That's not what they're doing. They're, having, they're, they're talking trash. They're, they're having a, one of those meetings of theirs. And the father knows that he doesn't get included in those meetings. Contrast this what happens in the beginning. The son felt so comfortable with the dad, the son came to him, yes? And the dad's been the same dad, so he's raised them the same way he's raising Yusuf. It's not like he raised them with spite and he raised them with love. I, we refuse to attribute something like that kind of unfairness to a prophet of Allah, alayhi salam. Especially a prophet who's de- 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 you know, described in the Quran as a model father. This is the guidance till the end of humanity. And Allah is going to de- give the example of a father over and over again, Yaqub alayhi salam, who was unfair in his parenting. I refuse to accept that. So he is giving them the opportunity to have that kind of openness with dad as Yusuf has. But they seem to prefer another road as they grow up. They seem to prefer they'd rather talk among each other and plan things among each other. And dad is there, open doors, waiting. That is there, but you can only go so much until if somebody doesn't want to walk through a door, it doesn't matter how, how, how wide you hold it open, you can't make someone walk through a door. 
right? So he, he seems to not be able to get through to these kids, and they only do things among themselves. So he says, when you tell them this, they're going to talk to each other, and when they talk to each other, this, this is going to become far worse. And it's going to be a pretty bad scheme, because I can see the way they look at you. It's not said, but it's understood here. I see the way they look at you. I see the tone they take when they talk to you. I see the way they pass the food to each other and they don't pass the food to you at the dinner table. I see the way they push you and then say, oh, sorry, accident. I see the way they exclude you from things. I see the way they'll, when they say your name, the tone and the intonation in their voice. The dad is so observant. He says, they're at a point now where I'm just worried that this could, what straw is going to break the camel's back? I don't know. Is it going to be this dream of, it, it could be this is it, that this is the last thing. It's not like it, they were perfectly fine with you before. They woke up and gave you a hug every morning. But now that you tell them this dream, they're like, huh. no, 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 no. This has been brewing. This has been building up. And this seems to be the climax of it. But when he tells his son this, this observant father, and he knows this is more than just a suspicion, he also recognizes this is, seems like a pretty serious family situation we got on our hands here. And it's almost like it turning, almost about to turn into an emergency situation, which it does. But I need you to take a step back and understand something, son. This is not a new game. The one that's playing a game with this family is not your brothers. They don't even know they are pawns in a game. And the one that's playing this game with them is the devil. And he's been playing this game for a very long time. And he will continue a play, to play this game with every single one of them and you and me if he gets a chance. He's going to come at us with jealousy, with suspicion. He's going to come at us with assumptions and judgment. He's going to come at us with lust and greed. He's going to come at us with hopelessness and despair and fear. He's going to use whatever he can to get to you. And right now, even though I told you, you have to be careful about your brothers, I need you to know something. I'm not saying your brothers are evil. I'm not saying, yes, your brothers are to the point where they might even try to hurt you and scheme against you and do something that we're not going to find out until it's too late. But I'm telling you that behind all of that is a much larger problem. And the much larger problem is where the ayah ends no doubt the devil when it comes to the human being is an open enemy it's like Yaqub is reminding himself that the devil told Allah when he was first cast out I will come at them from all directions I will fill your hell with them I will, I will make sure I'll, I'll take them off your straight path even if, you're, if they're a prophet's kid apparently even if they're raised by a prophet I will take them off the path I will make their jealousy so toxic. I will make their feelings so crazy that they will develop a world in and of itself. Those feelings will create an alternative universe in their minds and they will live in that universe. And in that universe, they will justify all kinds of things to themselves because of their feelings. And I will keep injecting steroids into those feelings so those feelings keep growing out of proportion and they can't see reality for what it is and the father diagnoses his kids as someone who have ill feelings and instead of taking the right road to address those feelings they allow those feelings to brew by talk, keeping it among themselves and talking to only those who will reinforce those negative feelings each other yeah I know right dad doesn't love us yeah me neither yeah you feel like that well I didn't feel like that yesterday but since the three of you brought it up yeah he hates us it's gonna grow and grow and grow and fester and that's what the devil wants because that's exactly what the devil felt himself when Adam alayhi salam was created and Allah said when I'm done creating him you're gonna make sajda he was festering that feeling angels asked are you really gonna create someone who's gonna spill blood but Adam alayhi, but Iblis didn't say nothing he just stayed quiet and then Allah that entire episode happened and he knew that sajda is coming but he said nothing he let it brew and fester inside and what was festering inside him why did he have to create him well I'm not here hello I'm Iblis I exist I'm right here I got all the qualifications you need I'm made of fire I can do all kinds of stuff I'm invisible I've been worshipping Allah for like so long, I can't even count, and all of a sudden this mud creature is going to come along and he gets the promotion? I don't understand why you don't see in me, what, what do you not see in me that you see in him? But he's not saying any of it. He's just quiet, 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 until it's too late. And that was his epic mistake. He says, well, if I made this mistake, I hate these human beings so much, I'm going to make sure they make this exact mistake. 
every one of them in their life. I'm going to get them to have a bad feeling and I'm going to have them keep that feeling to themselves and I'm going to let it turn into an infection until it grows and grows and grows and grows inside them until it becomes, you know, basically lethal and then it's going to fester out. It's going to come out in the ugliest way. And it, that's, that's what I want for them. That's what he wants for these brothers. He's doing exactly what, what he felt he's making them feel. That's one thing I learned about shaitan when studying shaitan in the Quran. Shaitan wants you to feel what he felt. And Yaqub alayhi salam in his wisdom sees it. He's obviously an enemy and he will come at them. Basically showing Allah, oh you think I went off the straight path, I'm so bad, huh? I'll show you how good they stay on your straight path. لَأَقْعُدَنَّ لَهُمْ عَلَى صِرَاتِكَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ We'll see. We'll see. But then the thing is, we, don't, we never see shaitan. We don't see some you know, guy holding a pitchfork, he's got a red costume on, he's got one of those you know, Italian pizza guy beards and like a long tail. And we, don't, we don't see this cartoon creature. It's, he's invisible to us. So how is Allah saying, that, how is Yaqub saying that the devil is no doubt an open enemy, a clear enemy, and he clarifies his animosity. Mubin is clear and clarifying, if you remember in the beginning. The Quran is clear and clarifying. First ayah, first ayah. Tilka ayatul kitabil mubin. The book that is clear and clarifying. And now you find the devil is clear and clarifying. What? What? The second time the word mubin occurs is for the devil? The first time it occurred is for the Quran? Why? Because Allah has made his word clear. And he's clarified to us the path. And the devil from day one has made his intentions clear. And Allah has made it clear in his word what he intends. And he will clarify for you what he wants you to do. He's not making it a secret. You think it's a secret. If you had the word of Allah with you, you wouldn't know that the devil's plan is not a secret? That jealousy, animosity, assumption, you know, all these things are not from the devil? You wouldn't know that? You wouldn't know how to check yourself? He's made himself clear. He's telling his son, listen, my sons have failed to recognize the scheme of the devil. They think it's their own feelings. And they forgot a truth, that the devil is obviously clearly an enemy to the human being. And son, I want you to remember, it's as if he's saying, son, I want you to remember, right now the devil's game is jealousy, but tomorrow the devil's game might be lust. And the day after that it might be greed. And the day after that it might be arrogance. And the day after that it might be forgetfulness. He will use different kinds of games, but all of them, whether he comes at you from the right, left, front, back, it doesn't matter. The devil's the real enemy, son. It's the devil you have to develop hatred for. Not them. Not them. Because it may be Allah has given, so long as a human being is breathing, there's hope that they can recognize the plot of the devil, shun the devil, and turn back to Allah. They, they have that opportunity. So if you hate people, it's as if you've condemned them where you should have been condemning only and only the devil. And there may be people in our family that have done all kinds of messed up stuff. But it may be that before their last breath, Allah shows them or they, they find it in their heart to turn back to Allah and shun the way of the devil and they recognize what shaitan had made them do all that time. It's possible. That's absolutely possible. And actually it does happen in the story. So in the shaitana lil insani mubin, certainly the devil is clearly an enemy to you. The last thing that I want to share with you, one, one point I skipped, by the way, this, these, these thoughts that I had about this ayah, I had Valerie write them out for me, 1 to 11 today and I was kind of re reading through them I had notes here, see, secret it doesn't even look like it, it's like I'm reading the Quran, right? Oh, but I had notes yeah, so cool anyway, so I skipped number uh, 6 and I had to write the word immunity so I'm going to tell you about what I meant from that what I meant from that is no family is immune from complications Allah will not give you and me a normal family there's going to be some weirdo in our family whether you like it or not there's going to be somebody who's trouble. That's just how he made us. And you wonder sometimes, you look at people in your family like, how are you my family? How are you and I even related? Like seriously. I don't even get it. It could be like that. But it's because Allah decided that you had to be around certain people in your life and they had to be your trial and you had to be theirs. And you're tied to them for life. You're just tied to them. How is Yaqub alayhi salam and Yusuf alayhi salam on the one hand and these brothers on the other like it's like a, a mismatch but it's not a mismatch it's a decree of Allah that they be family that they be blood that they're bonded to each other for better or for worse and so what we're learning from this is we have to let go of the idea of 
some kind of a life where the people in our lives, none of them are going to be a source of difficulty. And we also have to let go of the idea that the people that are a source of difficulty are somehow the devil. They're not. All we can say is, they may have failed to recognize the animosity of the devil towards them. They failed to recognize when the devil was able to use them successfully. When they were not let, able to let go of their pride. When they were not let, able to let go of their, their ill-conceived notions. We're also seeing the helplessness of a good father who knows that his children have a problem. Who better than a prophet to know that his children have a shaitan problem? Right? And he's, yet he's helpless. Because every human being has to take their own steps. You and me coming from a good family doesn't ensure that we're free from the, the, the trap of the devil. You see, you have in the Israelite way of looking things, looking at things, you have righteous lineage. Right? So you, you come from righteous chosen blood. So it's almost as if righteousness is passed down from a blessed lineage. You can have the most blessed lineage, but in that blessed lineage is also going to be the Israelites are a blessed lineage, and yet they have Qarun in them. Qarun came out of the Israelites, didn't he? Lut alayhi salam is clearly a blessed human being. His son didn't come out that blessed. You know, what does blessed lineage even mean? So you have Ismail alayhi salam, blessed lineage. Muhammad Rasulullah alayhi salam, comes from that lineage. But so does Abu Jahl. So does Abu Lahab. They're, they're tied by blood. They're tied by blood. So if we start thinking that blood is somehow more righteous, ethnicity is somehow more righteous, we're clearly deluded. The Qur'an makes that very clear. On the one hand, he tells the Israelites, I chose you over all other people, I gave you preference over all other people, and yet you've got his lineage, he's got this issue. Now, there's one last issue that maybe I'll, I'll talk to you guys about tomorrow. There is an opinion by some uh, ulama, I'll respectfully, I'll respectfully mention the opinion. I'll say two things about opinions today. Um, they hold a view that these, these brothers of Yusuf eventually repented and then Allah made them prophets too. Okay, that, that opinion does exist. I will respectfully and strongly disagree with that opinion. I will explain the rationale behind that opinion tomorrow and why I find myself disagreeing. Allah alone has all knowledge, but I will share with you what I feel about the subject based on my study of the Qur'an and also my discussions with Sheikh Suhaib. And in the spirit of transparency, uh, you know, um, Sheikh Suhaib and I talk virtually every day nowadays about the study of the surah and about other you know, Qur'an studies issues. And he actually strongly disagrees with me about what I said about sajda yesterday. So he doesn't believe, that he does believe that sajda was done out of respect to Adam alayhi salam and out of respect to Yusuf alayhi salam. And there's nothing wrong with that. It used to exist in previous scripture and all of that. And that is the majority opinion, to be honest with you. So I have an obscure view on this subject. Um, even though the language, he says the language is not as obvious. It can be extrapolated that way, but it's not as explicitly clear. It's a, it's a more difficult reading of it. I can, surrend, I can submit that much that that's not the typical reading of the ayah, but grammatically it's within the scope, which is why I take that liberty. But I still do find my position on it more comforting to myself and more you know, validated by other contexts, even though it linguistically doesn't violate something, but it's not the go-to, which, which is what his counter-argument is. So even the people that I love and respect and treat like my own and, and I think of like my own brother, we disagree among ourselves, but our love only increases. So that's how disagreements are, are, are talked about. And I wanted to be you know, transparent about that with you guys. So inshallah ta'ala, tomorrow we'll start with that opinion about whether or not they became prophets. And then inshallah, we're going to go to the, the second thing that Yaqub alayhi salam talked about, which is because this was just the first thing. The first thing was don't tell your brothers. Right? And then there's going to be the second thing that he tells uh, Yusuf alayhi salam. So we'll conclude with that. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Turn it off, turn it off.